We're going to get started uh, for the sake of time and so that we see on schedule. Our first speaker is Dr. Eric Skipper, and he's going to talk about perfusion and cannulation and mix. Uh, and we'll ask the panelists to, uh, to uh, after their presentation, to come sit on the panel uh, for the uh, discussion at the end of the talks. Dr. Skipper. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Dr. Ramchandani and all and and the entire team for uh, inviting me to come speak this year. Um, I'm going to try to just cover a few basics of uh, perfusion and cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And like the previous speakers, I'll apologize if I'm speaking at too basic a level. But I think understanding the basic level is key to success. Some 20 we'll say 20 years ago now, maybe a little longer than that, when I first became interested in minimally invasive cardiac surgery, um, as uh, Dr. Lumsden and others alluded to, a lot of my predecessors looked at me and went, why would you want to do that? So this is kind of why today. Uh, all the talks you're going to hear are uh, exemplary of, of why we want to do the things we do. Uh, when in Texas, this talk should be entitled Pumps and Pipes. Uh, but uh, very basic, very simple. I really don't have any disclosures relevant to this discussion, this presentation, but I do do some consulting, receive some grants and research support from a few companies, but none of them have anything to do with this talk. The objectives are just cover the basics, and the most important objective is the one at the bottom, the KISS principle. Keep it simple, and to not offend anybody, we'll just say Skipper. We'll just use my last name. Um, a lot of the strategies that we use day in and day out for conventional cardiac surgery apply to minimally invasive cardiac surgery. We want to reduce our uh, cardiopulmonary circuit surface. We want to reduce our prime volume. And we want to use modified ultrafiltration when appropriate to uh, kind of optimize the patient's volume status. With regard to uh, circuit surface, it's not hard. We can reduce a lot of our half-inch tubing to 3 8 inch tubing. We can augment our venous drainage. Uh, most all of us today use some sort of vacuum-assisted drainage, I'm sure. And re we can reduce the length of our circuit tubing. With regard to prime volume, we use low-prime oxygenators. Um, most programs have shifted to that. We use low-prime arterial filters. We use antegrade autologous priming and retrograde autologous priming to get rid of any crystalloid in the circuit. All of this helps keep patients happy in the end. We're a big believer in our institution in modified ultrafiltration. We use it during cardiopulmonary bypass. I did a case earlier this week where we actually ultrafiltrated almost three liters during the cardio bypass run. Uh, we use it post cardiopulmonary bypass on almost all our cases. Uh, we will ultrafiltrate for 10 minutes or for a liter, whichever comes first. Um, it's very difficult to get a lot of surgeons to stand there for 10 minutes while it happens. Uh, we found that this optimizes our hemoglobin and platelet counts at the end of the case and optimizes volume status. We uh, see a substantial uh, decrease in bleeding and have since we've uh, instituted this since about 2012. And we feel that it helps minimize the coagulopathic tendencies after cardiopulmonary bypass runs. Specifically with regard to cannulation, you can break this up into a number of uh, ways. One way to look at it would be conventional versus alternative, central versus remote, or then just by category, arterial, venous, venting, cardioplegia. We're going to take the last approach. When we're percutaneously placing catheters, um, ultrasound guidance should be the gold standard. I know a number of people in the audience are firm believers, but I, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, it has to do with um, safety and efficacy. If we look at uh, just basics, you can get a nice cross-sectional or longitudinal view of the vessel. Um, it's not hard. It just requires you to get used to doing it. There have been a number of studies that have proven it to be advantageous. Uh, it's very good at avoiding atherosclerotic plaques and arterial vessels. It's uh, great if you have altered anatomy. Uh, most all of us get 
CT scans ahead of time and we feel like we know what the anatomy is, but when you start sticking a needle in blindly, sometimes you may not be hitting that vessel exactly where you think you are. Um, and it can help you in patients that have had multiple previous procedures, such as multiple casts, multiple angiograms, and you can confirm that that vessel is actually still patent, whereas it might have been patent when they had their CAT scan. It may no longer be patent with multiple interventions since then. Um, we see in the studies that are published, improved success of cannulation, a reduction in time, a reduction in infections. Uh, we see improved cannulation rates, first pass attempt rates, reduced number of attempts, reduced time, and reduced complications. If we look at the venous side of the equation, it's equally impressive. You see reduction in time, increased accuracy of first pass attempts, and avoiding procedural complications such as unintended arterial punctures. Now, when I started cardiac surgery, um, there were a lot of dinosaurs around at the time, and one of my attendings uh, used to say, you do it the same way every time without exception. And this picture of a sternotomy approach here exemplifies what he wanted with, well, maybe minus the retrograde. We'll take the retrograde out of it. But he wanted it this way every time. You could be doing a single right graft, or you could be doing perforated pacer lead for a hemopericardium or a cabbage or a valve. But he wanted two venous cannulas, ramels on both cavas, an anagrade plege, a very carefully placed uh, arterial cannula, and he would be happy. But he felt it had to be that every time. Uh, we didn't exactly see eye to eye, especially when I joined the group and uh, began to uh, deviate from standard protocol. How you cannulate depends on where your incisions lay. You have to have a big armamentarium and you need to be able to apply it. So you can cannulate what's accessible and what fits through the hole. You need to have enough room left to do your procedure. So you see a couple of images from the 90s. Love these. A little upper sternotomy with a J to the right or a lower sternotomy if you're doing mitral valve surgery um, with a Again, a top T to the right. You can't get the same cannulas through these two holes. You have various non-sternotomy approaches. Uh, here's one on the left that's what I like to refer to as a, a man's incision. I give one of my partners grief when he does minimally, minimal access cabbage surgery uh, through the world's largest thoracotomy incision. I, I tell him that's a man's cab. Maximal access, non-sternotomy, cabbage. Uh, but you can take a standard size, big thoracotomy, and put a lot of cannula through that hole and still have plenty of room to work. But if you bring it down to a minimally invasive procedure such as this, you really don't have room for all that. With regard to the aorta, you can directly cannulate it if it's there in front of you. Uh, it can be for a uh, aortic valve or an upper sternotomy approach or a second or third interspace approach. Uh, you want to make sure there's ease of access. You want to make sure as the aorta moves further away from you that you're comfortable with alternative ways to tie knots other than with your fingers. You want to make sure the adventitia of the aorta is preserved as you would with a conventional operation. And you want to consider adding a reinforcing purse string at the end. Uh, to avoid those bleeding tendencies that sometimes can make you go back to the operating room. If you move to remote accesses, such as the femoral artery, um, whereas 20 years ago we would have gone in and completely skeletonized the common femoral, profunda femoris, and, su and superficial femoral arteries, you really don't want to do that today. It's, it's unnecessary and it creates problems. You want to expose the anterior surface and make sure you're on the common femoral artery well away from the bifurcation. I've found ovoid purse strings, uh, transversely oriented, uh, much like the shape of an American football, to be beneficial and minimize uh, stricture of the vessel. Seldinger technique is what I use routinely. Um, you want to confirm via echo that your wire is in the descending thoracic aorta, freely movable. And then you want to use atraumatic dilatations when you dilate the vessel. 
Yes, you can shove that big cannula directly in with the dial it with the uh, introducer that's in it, but you're going to get far more distal flaps when you do that. You want to insert the arterial cannula fully such that the tip is either in the proximal iliac or the distal, decent, uh, distal abdominal aorta. This lessens the likelihood that you'll get a, any sort of retrograde dissection. Those of you who are lucky enough to have access to the hybrid room three, four, five days a week, um, I think the hybrid room is a good consideration for these cases. It also opens up the opportunity for percutaneous access with imaging, such as uh, that we use every day in our structural heart programs for transcatheter aortic valves, and it allows us to use similar closure devices when we can have access to that. Other alternative routes exist. Uh, we have axillary artery cannulation. This just shows an axillary artery with a Gore-Tex graft attached to it or a, or a, a Dacron graft attached to it. Um, oftentimes, the uh, axillary artery is there, not in a terribly deep hole, and you can directly cannulate it. I use the same techniques for the axillary artery for direct cannulation as I do for a femoral artery. Same ovoid per string, atraumatic dilatations, and careful placement of the cannula tip. An advantage of using the uh, Gore-Tex or uh, Dacron graft is that you can sew it on the vessel, but that does require either occluding or uh, clamping the vessel, which has its own set of issues. Uh, but then you don't have to really worry about where your cannula tip lies within the vessel. Cross clamp options. Well, you can either use a standard conventional technique of external cross clamping, uh, you can use your standard cross clamp if you're doing this through an upper sternotomy incision for, so for example, aortic valve surgery. Or if you move to a thoracotomy approach, you can use alternative means such as a chitwood clamp or a cross clamp with a flexible shaft. Some are detachable, some remain attached, but basically it allows the clamp to fall over out of your way. You can do an endo clamp. Uh, Endoclamps work great. They've evolved nicely over the last 20 to 22 years. Um, you can either use those through femoral access or direct aortic access. But basically, it's a long balloon catheter that, uh, as you saw earlier today, kind of started with Dr. Fogarty many, many, many years ago. Uh, this is a picture of a, uh, an example of the endoarterial clamp via femoral platform. You can see starred down here, this is where the catheter goes into a, a side branch of the arterial cannula, and the balloon sits up in the ascending aorta. You can't always get there from below, as we heard alluded to during the transcatheter valve talks earlier. Uh, sometimes there are obstructions, and it's just not a good route to take. You can use an endoclamp via uh, direct aortic access, where your balloon goes in through a aortic cannula placed directly into the ascending aorta and allows you to cross clamp your aorta from, from that uh, route. This is a little close up, an artist rendition, where the balloon comes in through the catheter and is directed toward the aortic valve, and then flow from the cannula comes out and is directed toward the aortic arch and out to the body. Obviously, this isn't a good choice for an aortic valve operation, although it has been used for such. Um, it's been a long time, but I've uh, actually used it as such. Um, but it is a nice option for mitral valve and other uh, structural heart operations. This just gives you an idea of how you can achieve that through a thoracotomy type approach. Uh, you see the retra retractor in here, but through a port, you can place your cannula and guide your uh, Y arterial cannula into the ascending aorta to then place your endoaortic endo balloon camp, clamp through that. And this shows you a surgical picture with the balloon in place and the catheter in place. Venous access. Um, if not placing the cannula centrally, which you can do if you're doing an upper sternotomy approach or if you're doing a second interspace approach and you choose to make your incision a little bigger, you can actually get all your cannulas through that incision. 
Uh, but in most cases, most of us use a multi-stage femoral venous cannula, either a 25 or a 23. You can even go smaller depending on how much vacuum you want to use on your line uh, for unloading of the atrium. You need a bicaval view on transesophageal echo for placement. Um, typically, if you're using a femoral platform, you're doing an open technique. Uh, you're already there for the artery, so the vein's right beside it. You want to expose the anterior surface of the vein, avoiding a lot of unnecessary dissection because you don't want to create a lot of lymphatic disruption. Um, large purse strings, no reason not to, just make it generous. Your life will be much more simple. And then Seldinger technique of cannulation. Now, if for some reason your arterial cannula isn't in that uh, groin site, you can percutaneously cannulate this vessel with ease. You want to use ultrasound guidance to make sure you don't penetrate through the artery to get to the vein. You want to make sure you're penetrating exactly where you want to be. Again, you use a Seldinger technique, but you're going to want a stiff guide wire. I use an Amplatz J-tip. Uh, you want to make sure that wire goes up very freely. You saw nice examples earlier this morning of wires getting uh, caught on plaque or in kinks and not wanting to go, and you certainly don't want to perforate anything. Stiff wires are, uh, make it very easy to perforate things. You want to use serial dilators. Uh, most catheters come with a very nice, uh, generous dilator at the end that allows things to flow in nicely. You want to position the tip of your catheter in the superior vena cava, and we'll talk a little bit more about that with some illustrations in a minute. And then it's pretty simple. It's a low-pressure system. When you pull it out, a nice use stitch takes care of things. This is an example of a, a multi-stage femoral venous catheter. Uh, again, Seldinger technique, you want to get wire access. You want to hopefully get your wire into the superior vena cava. You typically insert the cannula until the basket of holes are within the venous system. And then you want to withdraw the introducer back to the marks that tell you the introducer is no longer protruding through the tip of the catheter. This basically gives you a nice blunt atraumatic vessel to pass up through the IVC, through the right atrium, and having this uh, introducer pulled back allows the cannula to sit down posteriorly nicely on the wire and slip right up into the SVC in almost every instance. Venting. Well, it's pretty simple. If the pulmonary vein's sitting in front of you and you need to vent, it's easy to put a purse string in the right superior pulmonary vein put a vent in just like you would for an open procedure if you were going to use a vent for that. Um, oftentimes, through a limited access approach, it's difficult to uh, cross the mitral valve into the LV. You certainly don't want to create any bleeding problems. So oftentimes, it's best just to leave the vent in the left atrium and accept that and not try to get overly aggressive. There are remote cannulation options, such as placing a pulmonary artery endovent. Um, I use that for all of my mitral cases. I don't use it for my aortic cases. But basically, it's a nice balloon tip catheter that floats just like a swan, but allows you to vent blood from the pulmonary artery during the procedure. Um, my preferred method is a uh, long cannula in the ascending aorta for venting the ascending aorta. I do a pledged mattress stitch. I have a Y connector that allows me to connect my vent tubing and my anti-grade cardioplegia tubing to this catheter. And if I'm doing a mini AVR, I will put the cannula in, I will give anti-grade plege, I'll then take it out, snare my ramel down on my pledge of sutures, get the anti-grade plegia catheter and vent out of my way and open the aorta and proceed. With cardioplegia, you can follow Conventional techniques where you put it in just like you do through a sternotomy, put in your anti-grade plege, put in your retrograde plege, and oftentimes that's very easy. If you're doing a second interspace AVR or an upper sternotomy AVR, uh, the right atrium's right there. It's easy to put a purse string in, and uh, it's not terribly difficult to place a retrograde cardioplegia catheter blindly without putting your hand down there to feel and get it to go out the coronary sinus. Um, but more and more today, I think people are using a lot of anti-grade cardioplegia. 
So again, as I stated with venting, uh, I tend to use the anti approach uh, for my cardioplegia unless there's significant AI. If there's significant AI, oftentimes I'll give cardioplegia. I will give just enough to stop the heart but not overly distend the heart. And then I'll open the aorta and give direct coronary uh, cardioplegia with handhelds. The other option for this would be just to plan, a, plan on using retrograde. But you have multiple options for that. You have the endoplege coronary sinus catheter. This is the IJ catheter placed typically by anesthesia. Um, it works wonderfully. It too has evolved over the last 20 plus years, uh, but it does require uh, experience, ability, and some additional time to place the catheter. Some programs will say freely that it doesn't take them any extra time. Um, I've found that it does take time and, and thus I very rarely use this today. Currently, myocardial preservation is important, so you need to have a really good strategy for how you're going to deliver your anti-grade or your retrograde cardioplegia. There's a lot of scrutiny. Your minimally invasive patients are expected to do better than your maximally invasive patients. So you really want to make sure that heart works. Um, we heard today the right heart's much happier after TAVR without a pump run than it is after SAVR. So you really can't afford to have your minimally invasive aortic valve or mitral valve, mitral valve patients having problems. So you want to make sure that heart's well protected. The thing that's really helped the minimally invasive front over the last several years is the use of longer acting cardioplegia solutions. So modified Del Nido solutions or custodial solutions have become very um, commonplace and um, all the studies have shown that they are uh, equally effect, efficacious with regard to protecting the heart and outcomes. So personally within my practice, I uh, prefer a non-sternotomy approach for my minimally invasive surgeries. I uh, think there is something to be gained by not cutting the sternum. Um, I will get a CTA of these patients ahead of time, 100% of the time, because I want to know what's there. I want to know if there's any unusual uh, atherosclerotic plaques in the aorta that might sway my cannulation strategies. Um, I favor femoral cannulation for arterial and venous access for both many aortics and many mitrals. Um, primarily an open technique, and in my institution, this is largely limited uh, by the hybrid room availability. Um, I will use percutaneous techniques if I don't need to make an incision in the groin. I use a um, LA or an LV vent via the right superior pulmonary vein for my mini aortics, but I'll use a PA vent uh, for my mini mitrals. I use direct aortic anti-grade cardioplegia for virtually all my cases unless there is significant AI, uh, and then I'll induce with anti-grade and go to handheld if it's a mini aortic, or I'll just plan on retrograde if it's a mini mitral. Um, it's pretty unusual for you to be doing a mini mitral if there's bad aortic insufficiency. I use modified Del Nido uh, cardioplegia, and we have since, uh, well, I have since 2011. Our institutions used it since 2012. And then everybody gets uh, surgeon-applied nerve blocks and on-Q catheters because I think that also puts a different flavor in the patient's mouth after the procedure. Um, I think, as has been pointed out at multiple points this morning, it is a team sport. Uh, it requires all aspects of the team to work well. You have to pick your strategy that fits the patient. Not every strategy, not, not a strategy fits every patient. And you need to have a backup plan. If you go into minimally invasive cases without a backup plan, at some point you're going to get burned. And you really want to avoid that. And with that, I'll stop to try to keep us on time. And uh, I think we'll do questions a little later. Thank you, Dr. Skipper.